Elmer by David McKing. There was once a herd of elephants, elephants young, elephants old, elephants tall or fat or thin, elephants like this, that or the other, all different but all happy and all the same colour. All that is except for Elmer. Elmer was different. Elmer was patchwork. Elmer was yellow and orange and red and pink and purple and blue and green and black and white. Elmer was not elephant coloured. It was Elmer who kept the elephants happy. Sometimes he joked with the other elephants, sometimes they joked with him, but if there was even a little smile, it was usually Elmer who started it. One night, Elmer couldn't sleep for thinking, and the think that he was thinking was that he was tired of being different. Who ever heard of a patchwork elephant, he thought. No wonder they laugh at me. In the morning, before the others were really awake, Elmer slipped quietly away, unnoticed. As he walked through the jungle, Elmer met other animals. They always said, good morning, Elmer. Each time, Elmer smiled and said, good morning. After a long walk, Elmer found what he was looking for. A large bush, a large bush covered with berries, a large bush covered with elephant coloured berries. Elmer caught hold of the bush and shook it and shook it and shook it so that the berries fell on the ground. Once the ground was covered in berries, Elmer lay down and rolled over and over, this way and that way, and back again. Then he picked up bunches of berries and rubbed himself all over, covering himself with berry juice, until there wasn't a sign of yellow or orange or red or pink or purple or blue or green or black or white. When he had finished, Elmer looked like any other elephant. After that, Elmer set back off to the herd. On the way, he passed the other animals again. This time, each one said to him, Good morning, elephant. And each time, Elmer smiled and said, Good morning, pleased that he wasn't recognised. When Elmer rejoined the other elephants, they were all standing quietly. None of them noticed Elmer as he worked his way into the middle of the herd. After a while, Elmer felt that something was wrong. But what? He looked around. Same old jungle, same old bright sky, same old rain cloud that came over from time to time, and lastly, same old elephants. Elmer looked at them. The elephants were standing absolutely still. Elmer had never seen them so serious before. The more he looked at the serious, silent, still standing elephants, the more he wanted to laugh. Finally, he could bear it no longer. He lifted his trunk and at the top of his voice shouted, Boo! The elephants jumped and fell, always in surprise. Oh my gosh and golly, they said, and then saw Elmer, helpless with laughter. Elmer, they said, it must be Elmer. Then the other elephants laughed too, as they had never laughed before. As they laughed, the rain cloud burst, and when the rain fell on Elmer, his patchwork started to show again. The elephants still laughed as Elmer was washed back to normal. Oh, Elmer! gasped an old elephant. You've played some good jokes, but this has been the biggest laugh of all. It didn't take you long to show your true colours. We must celebrate this day every year, said another. This will be Elmer's day. All elephants must decorate themselves and Elmer will decorate himself elephant colour. And that is exactly what the elephants do. On one day a year, they decorate themselves and parade. On that day, if you happen to see an elephant of ordinary elephant colour, you'll know it must be Elmer. Hi. So today we are going to have a look at exclamations. Now the punctuation for an exclamation is like this. It is an exclamation mark and it is the only type of sentence to use that type of punctuation. There are of course four types of sentences. Two of them use full stops. That's a statement and a command one of them and the other one uses a question mark and they are questions so today we are going to look at the exclamations now if we're being super technical about it then an exclamation is actually a really restrictive type of sentence because if we're looking at an exclamation in its truest sense it will always start with one of two words and it will always end with a verb. So it will always start with how or what and it will always end in a verb. For example, how lively you are. 
how lively you are. Or if we wanted to use this one, um, then we would have to add more onto the end than we would imagine. What a lovely day it is. So in its purest form, an exclamation will start with the word how or what and will end with the verb to be, so are or is, um, and then obviously an exclamation mark. However, this is not the only way that authors use an exclamation mark. And it's not the only thing that the general public would assume is an exclamation. Now, some people use exclamation marks all the time just to show that they're excited. It doesn't quite work like that. Um, but exclamation marks can be used when you're writing if somebody is shouting and they do show the element of excitement. We just have to be really clear by what that is. And I went to the shops isn't really a particularly exciting sentence. If we're showing that people are shouting, then we can do one of two things. We can finish it with an exclamation mark, but we can also write in capital letters. So if they're having an argument in our story, then we could write the bits that are being shouted in capital letters. Generally, we don't write in capital letters and generally we only use capital letters at the beginning of sentences or proper nouns. But if we want to use it for effect, then that's absolutely fine. And that is basically what we are doing with the exclamation mark if we use it to show shouting or if we use it at the end of a particularly exciting sentence um we are using it for effect we'll have a go at writing some true exclamations and then we'll have a go at writing some um exciting sentences and things that might be shouted that we could equally use an exclamation mark for for effect so to start with Let's have a look at using a pure exclamation. It's going to start with how or what, and we'll do it based on the story that I read this week. So we'll do it based on Elma. So I have the perfect idea. I am going to do it based on when the elephants find out that it's Elma that was hiding and playing a trick. So I am going to start with the word what. Can you think of a sentence? Can you think of an exclamation that you could use? Maybe about that bit of the story, maybe about a different um, bit of the story if you wanted to. Um, I've got mine here as a true exclamation. It ends in R and it starts with what. What a funny elephant you are. Or, what a lot of colours you have. So again, it ends in that verb. And it starts with the word what. I wonder if we could do one that starts with how. Because that was the other word that we could put at the front of um, a true exclamation as well. Um, we could use the word how. Maybe we could say how funny you are. I know it's not how we would normally speak. It generally isn't, which is why we also use exclamations for effect as well. How inventive you are. I like that. And of course, are at the end is um, a verb. So that absolutely works. It started with how and it ended in are. With an exclamation at the end. How inventive you are. So true exclamation starts with how or what will always end in a verb and then obviously has the exclamation mark at the end. Let's have a think about things that those characters might have shouted then. If we think that we can use an exclamation mark for effect when characters shout then let's have a think about things that they may have shouted. So we're talking about Elma. What might they have shouted? They might have shouted Oh, now that's trickier because who's that is technically a question as well as one. So it would have both at the end of it. They might have shouted, look at Elma. Absolutely. They might have shouted, look at Elma. And that would finish with an exclamation mark. Absolutely. 
um they might have shouted they might have just shouted you're so funny you are so funny yeah absolutely that would end with an exclamation too wouldn't it you are so funny and so then the last idea was the idea of using um an exclamation mark for effect at the end of a sentence where um there's like a big emotion that is shown so that emotion might be love it might be anger it might be excitement um generally used with shorter phrases although not exclusively so for example the phrase i love you might be finished with an exclamation mark or i'm so cross or you are mean or something that is um so it's something that is angry or something that is full of love or something that is exciting any of which could be finished using an exclamation mark and we would be therefore using it for effect so let's have a little go at writing some exclamations using exclamation marks for effect and we'll see how we get on so we might write you are so annoying <laughs> yeah absolutely you are so annoying at the end we have the exclamation mark at the beginning we have a capital letter and in between we make sure that we have a finger space in between each of our words to make it really clear where those words are okay we could also write oh there's so many things that we could write but they wouldn't be very nice i know we could write i could pop if we were talking about being so excited we could pop or we could burst we could use that as an exclamation too where do you think that you would use an exclamation within a piece of writing do you think that you would use an exclamation if you were writing like a newspaper report or like a formal um, piece of writing? No, probably not. I would say that you're more likely to find exclamation marks in um, informal writing, in stories, definitely, maybe in like informal letters and things like that. But yeah, definitely stories, I think, would be a good place to find exclamations because obviously we want the story to be interesting. So we will use um big emotions within a story and we know that we can use um we can use the exclamations for effect there okay so there were three different things that we looked at when it came to exclamations there were the purest sense of the word exclamations that begin with how or what and end in a verb then there were using exclamations for effect with the short sentences for big emotions and there was also um, using exclamation marks for shouting as well, um, which obviously that would be within a story because tend not to get shouting in, um, in, in letters or in newspaper reports, things like that. Let's have a go at writing some sentences and we will work out whether or not it needs an exclamation mark or not. I'm going to base it based on the story, um, based on Elmer, um, because I find it easier to have something to think of um you can write different ones or you could write the same one it would probably be good if you wrote the same one and then tried to see if you could put the right punctuation in it so my first sentence is elmer rolled around and around remember it will always start with a capital letter and then does it need an exclamation at the end well it doesn't start in how or what it's not somebody talking, not somebody shouting, and it's not short and like really exciting or really sad or... So no, well done, it doesn't. Elmer rolled around and around would not be an exclamation. It would be a statement. Well done. What about if we did something that actually didn't happen in the story, but we used the same characters? And what about if it was tiger shouted come back here elmer so tiger shouted come back here elmer would that need one at the end don't forget you need a capital letter for elmer and tiger but mainly tiger because it's the beginning of the sentence what do you reckon 
Yes, absolutely. Spot on. Tiger shouted, come back here, Elma. Yeah, they shouted it. We even said that in the sentence at the beginning. Sometimes you don't say that, but we, we did. So yeah, absolutely. We can use that exclamation for effect there for somebody shouting. What about the following sentence? What about, what about if we use the sentence, what a great day Elmer had. What a great day. In fact, let's just stop at Elmer. What a great day, Elmer. And you can see what I was trying to do was to turn it into a truest form exclamation, but it just didn't sound right. What a great day, Elmer, would still be an exclamation. We can still use an exclamation mark, um, but we would be doing it for effect. Because although it started with a what, I couldn't get it to end in a, a verb without it sounding really, really odd. So instead, I got rid of the verb and still used it as an exclamation. We were fine to do that. Exclamations are trickier. We don't find them all the time. But just remember that they can be used for those three reasons and that they'll always start with a capital letter and that they finish with that exclamation mark. The exclamation mark is long and then the full stop is near the bottom in a similar way to a full stop. Whatever you do with the rest of your day, have a good one. Bye bye. Hi. So today we are going to have a look at 3D shapes. Now 3D shapes are ones that we can pick up and we can hold. They are three dimensional. I will be suggesting that you go and see if you can find some of these um, at various points in the video. But before we do that, we need to have a look at what we've got and what they are called. So we'll start with this one. This one is a cube. Now I have an example of a cube here. This is a nice big one, but yeah, a die, a dice is um, an example of a cube. I wonder, can you think of any other examples of cube? You might have building blocks. Yeah, that's probably, a, that's a good example of that. Lots of them in real day, everyday life look more like this or this and these are the same shape although they're not identical they are the same shape and they're basically like a cube that has been stretched out and their name is a cuboid a cuboid can you say that it's a weird name isn't it a cuboid i have a cabinet just in front of me that is a cuboid and a photo frame is a cuboid it's a skinny one but it is still a cuboid um fridge my kitchen cupboard the bricks that make up my house there are loads of cuboids around us what about this one this one is the hardest one to say this one is a sphere can you say that sphere not a sophia a sphere and basically, this is the perfect example of that. A ball. And then I have a cylinder. A cylinder. My pen is a cylinder. A can is a cylinder. Yeah. Okay. a cone and if I hold it this way up I could have a teeny tiny ice cream cone um so this one is a cone and it has it's, it's round and then this one and this one are very similar in what they are they are both pyramids but if I show you their bottoms <laughs> if I show you their bottoms this one is a square based pyramid and this one is a triangular based pyramid because this one has a square bottom and this one has a triangle bottom. But they come together at a point at the top. So we've got a triangular prism, a, a triangular pyramid and a square based pyramid. I'm throwing them around. Um, and then the last one, which I nearly gave away, was this one. And this one is a triangular because it's got a triangle face at either end. This is a triangular prism. And with a prism, I could cut into this at any point going down this way 
and the face I would get would always be a triangle because this is a triangular prism. Technically, this is a prism. It's a circle prism, cylindrical prism. Um, and at any point that we would cut into it, we would get a circle face. This is a square prism. Every time we cut into it, we would get a square. So this is a triangular prism because each time we cut down through the top, we would get a triangle face. Prisms might be trickier to spot, although they might not, because if I look out of my window, then there are an awful lot of roofs that look like this that are pitched. So where I live, there are lots of pitched roofs. So the roofs are prisms, but it's not the most common. So let's have a quick recap of what they were, and then we will have a look at their properties. We'll have a look at how they're made up. So we had sphere, well done. Triangular prism. Cone. Cube. Triangular based pyramid. Well done. Cuboid. Cuboid. Well done, I thought I was going to catch you out. Square based pyramid. I'm a cylinder, well done. So our 3D shapes are made up of lots of different bits. There are faces. My sphere has one curved face. It's all the way around, there's one curved face. That's all the sphere has. This one has one curved face and one, two flat faces. Where the two faces meet, there's an edge. So where two faces meet, there is an edge. And that's all there is on this shape. There's one, two, three faces and one, two curved edges. And then where the edges meet, there is, if it's one, then it's a vertex or if there are lots of them, then they're vertices. So if we use the triangular base pyramid as an example, then there's one, two, three, four faces. This is two here, these two that I have, and then this one, and then there's one underneath. So there are four faces, and then where those faces meet, there are edges, so one, two, three, four, oh, hang on, one, two, three going down, four, five, six going around. So there are six edges and then the vertices are the pointy bits are where the edges meet. So we've got one, two, three and one on top, four. So the pyramid has four vertices, six edges and four faces. But if it was a square based pyramid, it would be slightly different because it has four faces around the outside and one on the bottom. So it has five flat faces. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight edges. And it has four at the bottom and one on the top, five vertices. So this one has more edges and more faces and more vertices than this one because of the shape that's on the bottom of them. This cone is odd, but it has one flat face and one curved face. It has one edge and it has one vertex. It has one vertex at the top and one curved edge at the bottom. So this has, is an example of a curved face, a flat face, and then it has um, a curved edge and it has a vertex at the other end. Okay, so then we've got the triangular prism. Now the triangular prism has one, two, three, four, five faces. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then the same at the other end, seven, eight, nine edges. 
and six vertices because there's three on this um, end and there's three on the opposite end. And then we're left with a cube and a cuboid. Now, in terms of the number of faces that they have, they are identical, but they are different in the shapes that they are. And that's the same within cuboids because this obviously has some square um, faces, but this, which is also a cuboid, does not. But they have the same number. So they have one, two, three, four, five, and one at this end, six. So they have six faces. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the same at the other end, nine, 10, 11, 12. So they have six faces, 12 edges, and one, two, three, four, look, four vertices on this end and four vertices on this end. That one's the cuboid. And then the cube has the same number of faces. So two here, two here, and two here. So it has six faces. Um, it has eight vertices because there's four on that end and four on that end. And it has the same number of edges because two here, two here, and then so four, five, six, seven, eight, and the same at the other end, nine, 10, 11, 12. Hmm. Which of our shapes had the least number of vertices? I'm just trying to find it because it keeps rolling away. Which one had the least number of vertices? Absolutely, the sphere did. Which one had the most? Which one had the greatest number of vertices? Remember, vertices are where the edges meet. So the sphere had the least because it didn't have any. And these guys have the same number. Okay, these guys have eight each. That was the most out of all of them because this one only had six. This one had five because of the one at the top. And this one had four because of the one at the top. This one had one. And this one had none because the two edges don't meet. They're at either end on this one. There's an edge here and an edge here. Okay, so some of these shapes have curved faces and some of these shapes have flat faces. I have one that has curved faces, two that have curved faces, three that have curved that have curved faces and then all of the others are made up of only flat faces. I wonder if you could make some predictions about the curved faced shapes compared to the flat faced shapes. Yeah I think if you were to experiment with them they would roll much better, the curved faced ones would roll much better than the flat faced ones because these have flat faces and these are curved. Let's see if we can find some then. Let's see if we can find some examples. So I will give you a minute or so and I would like you to go and see if you can do some spotting of some examples of the 3D shapes that we have talked about today. I'll give you a little minute. And while you're gone, I'll do a recap of what those shapes are. If you're still watching, you can see. So, sphere, triangular prism, cuboid, also cuboid, cylinder, triangular based pyramid, cone, cube square-based pyramid. Okay, what examples did you manage to find? Yeah, a ball. Yeah. A clock, that's a good example. I have a big round clock. That is a cylinder indeed, you're right. Um, yeah, yeah, building blocks. Yeah, die, if you've got a dice for a game or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that was tricky. Do you remember I said that the roofs where where um I live are this sort of shape? Yeah. Um 
there's a famous chocolate that's this sort of shape too. Um, cuboid's quite easy to find. There's lots of boxes. And my cereals come in a cuboid box. Yeah. The others are certainly trickier, aren't they? The pyramids and the cones are a bit trickier, but you'll have to have a look and see what you can see. Hi. So this week I read the story of Elmer. Elmer is a story all about a patchwork elephant. So the patchwork elephant is all the different colours. So that made me think about a little experiment that we could do where we could practice our recording skills. But if you haven't listened to the story of Elmer, go and watch it. It's a brilliant story. So I thought we would get into the theory of colour a little bit today. So I have got with me um, three different food colourings. I have a load of little um, glasses for mixing and I have some water because we don't need to do it with anything other than that. Now you do not need any of those things in order to be able to uh, join in if you have those things and you would like to join in and your adult says that that is okay then you can pause the video you can go and get all of those things um but if you don't have all those things it's really not the end of the world you can definitely still join in and the focus that i would like us to have today is one of recording our observations so even if you're just watching then having something to write with and something to write on would be a really great idea because that would allow you to practice the art of recording your observations so if you don't have those things with you already then i suggest you pause the video go and find them and then come back and join us and we will get into a little bit of colour theory. Okay, hopefully you went away and you found there's something to write with and something to write on, even if you didn't find anything else. We're going to have a go at colour mixing today. Now, the reason that I only have three colours with me are that there are three primary colours. We have red, blue, and yellow and we are going to use these pigments these colors to see what other colors we can create because in theory we can create most colors using just these but we're going to have a think about how we record that how we write that down now one way that we could do that if we have plenty of different colored pencils or pens or chalks or whatever it was then we could do that just using color we could do it writing full sentences or we could do it using a combination of different things. So for me, I think the most straightforward way of doing it, which gives us plenty of time to have fun doing our mixing, but will also give us some good uh, end result, is to use some mathematical equations and a combination of that and words. So I think if we were to mix together yellow and blue then we could use the add sign in between those words i only have one color pen so i am going to write the words if you had different colors you could do a bit a block of yellow add a block of blue equals and then whatever color we end up with but i don't have that so i am going to write the word so i am going to write the word yellow and then an add sign and then blue and then an equal sign. So I have yellow, add blue equals, and then I can do the mixing and I can put it at the end. Now I could do this and I could go through one by one. I think what would be a really good idea would be to write down a few and then test a few and then come back and forward. So I mixed my yellow and my blue. What about if I mixed blue? and red. So maybe that's the one that I'll write underneath. Maybe I'll do blue and red equals. And then that gives me two to test. And then maybe I could add one more and then test and then come back. So maybe I could do yellow and red and see what we end up with there. So I'm going to write that one down. So I'm going to write my yellow, my plus and my red and then my equal sign. So I will end up with this. And then I can 
test them and then I can come back and write my findings in because don't forget that we can use mathematical symbols in anything that we want and this just means and just means this and this and this one here just means equal or is the same as so we can use our mathematical equations we can use our maths learning across all sorts of different things but the equal sign this one it just means is the same as so yellow and blue is the same as whatever it might be so i've got my little glass here look in here i am going to put some yellow i don't need a lot i'm just going to put a little bit in the bottom and i'm going to put a little bit of blue in again not a lot just a little bit there you go look you can see them both and then the reason that i bought the water was because the water will then mix all of that together and will give us a different color now my only issue is that my yellow was stuck to the bottom a little bit so i'll just add a little bit more yellow in the hope that that might mix together better there we go the yellow seems intent on sitting at the surface but I just dropped a bit on the table and if I just mop it up then it should show you that it's gone green. Can you see the green around the outside? The yellow seems intent on staying split look which is a bit of a pain but maybe if I shake it it might go back together and then we can put it in see sometimes our best plans don't go right there you go look we can see at the bottom of our cup that the water at the bottom is green where they have mixed and then we do have this blue bit and this yellow bit at the top which is unusual and we shouldn't really have but my yellow and my blue mixed together and they gave us green now we actually ended up with a really dark green so i am going to write dark green in my findings and then maybe we can have a think about why it might be that it was dark green and whether or not we could change that but maybe we'll do a little bit more we'll do the blue and the red first so different glass little bit of Oh, not a little bit, a lot of bit. Let me just get rid of a bit of that into a different one. We'll use it in a minute. So a little bit of blue, and then we were going to mix in with that some red, weren't we? So there's our blue in there, look. And we'll mix in with that some red. Give that a little swishy swishy before we add the water to just dilute the colour and show there we go can you see that that color is it's it's like an indigo color it does have a hint of red to it it is a bit purpley but i do think that the color that i would write down is 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 more is darker than that so either i can write down really dark purple or i could write down indigo whichever one makes sense to me so i'm going to go for dark purple is what i'm going to write down and then i'm going to try and mix together yellow and red my yellow wasn't brilliant was it it didn't seem to want to work in the way that we expected it to but hey ho never mind let's we we'll give it a go we'll give it a try and see so yellow in the bottom we will add a touch of red to it we'll give it a swooshy swooshy and then you can see that already look without me even adding it we've got again it's super dark but we've got like a really like a burnt amber type orange so we've got a really dark orange there now i have had to use the word dark on every single one that i created so far and put the lids on these momentarily so that i don't drop them and end up with food coloring all over myself um so so far i've had to write the word dark on every single one now why do you think that might be so we found that we can get green and we can get purple and we can get orange by mixing the different combinations together so we've mixed yellow and blue we've mixed yellow and red we've mixed red and yellow we've mixed red and blue so 
we have the different combinations that we can mix together but every single one when we did our recording we wrote it down as a math symbol and then i said i think when we're doing our observations it's really important to write down the word dark because they were all really dark can you think of a reason that we might have only really dark colours or that we might need to make some changes in order to change that. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Maybe I use too much of something. Now, the difficulty is when it comes to colours, some colours are more pigmented, have a stronger pigment, a stronger colour than others. So blue, for example, is a really strong colour where yellow is a much weaker colour. So anything where I am trying to add yellow to it to form a foundation of a different colour, I am going to need only the tiniest bit of a darker pigment, so the blue, or in fact the red, to a much bigger proportion of the, the, the light of the weaker pigment, which in this case is the yellow. So let's try first of all with an orange so let's just go for i'll do the red first because that will hopefully i can control it now here we go all we want is just the tiniest little drop in the bottom let's see if we right there's one drop in there cool we'll just soak that up so we don't get it anywhere else so there's one drop of red in the bottom just one because that's our stronger pigment. And then we are going to go in with yellow, but we are going to add more yellow than we did red. So the red is just there in the bottom look, just a little drop, but the yellow, we are going to add quite a bit more of, okay? And then we'll swooshy, 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 we'll mix it together. Yeah, maybe even a tiny bit more yellow swooshy 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 and then if i add so you can see look in the bottom that our orange is is much lighter this time and then if i add the water just to dilute it we can see we definitely have it's still quite a reddy orange color but i think that's partly because the yellow is quite a reddy color as well but it's definitely a much lighter version of our orange than the one that we first started with now if we were to we could set up a different experiment here and we could see how much more yellow pigment do we need than red in order to create a lighter yellow, couldn't we? Now, we did an experiment there where we changed the level of yellow because yellow was our weakest pigment. What about if we were going to mix these two? Have a little look at your recordings. What did you find that that was? When we mixed red and blue, what did we end up with? Right, we ended up with a really dark purple. How could we make a lighter purple? Which pigment is strong? Absolutely. Let's start with that blue and let's just add the tiniest drop and then let's see whether or not we can make a lighter purple using that. Right, you ready? Right, there's one drop in the bottom. There's one drop in the bottom. Now, the other thing is that we're not actually making a a ton of it if we were making um it more then it, we would be able to sort of create a slightly different color so we've got that in there and then we are going to add some red to it but we're going to add more red go than we did blue these ones are much thicker i will give them a little swishy swishy without water but i think they might need the water let's just put a tiny bit in first and then we can give it a mix around yeah and then there we go and then we can dilute it a little bit more so that we can see it and you can see this time that it looks a bit more like berries it's very definitely purple in color this time it looks a lot more like berries than our first attempt at purple which was very very blue you can see the difference there so depending on the shade that we want we need to use different amounts of each one now we actually can do this on the computer as well. So if we are editing photographs, for example, then we can pull out the different greens, blues, reds, yellows in a picture. Now green is a combination of which two colours? Well done. It's 
combination of yellow and blue, but we can pull that out as a digital colour because it appears lots. And so we can heighten the level of different colours. So it might be that we want to have more blue. We want like a more bluey purple. So we want more blue than we've got red. It might be that we want um, a really vibrant green. So in actual fact, we might end up adding some other um, pigments into that as well. So we can change colour manually. We can do it with paints. We can do it with... Um, pastel colours, we can do it with watercolours, we can mix all sorts of different things together. We can do it with food colouring, do it with icing and things like that. But we can also do it digitally now too. And it's exactly the same process. I think that's really interesting. I also think that it shows us how important our observations are. Because I could have just written down that my yellow and blue made green and that my blue and red made purple and that my yellow and red made orange. But I wouldn't have the same colour every time I went to it. Now, in actual fact, if I was going to continue this and I was going to do more, I would need to change what I added in here. And it might be that I put one drop yellow, one drop blue equals really dark green. Two drops yellow, one drop blue equals, and then I could put what it equals. Those more detailed observations would give me a better idea and a better understanding of what it was that I'd seen and would allow me to go back and to repeat that at a different time. So when we're doing recording, it's super important that we add as much detail into that as we can. And it doesn't have to be reams and reams of sentences. It just needs to be detail. It just needs to be the important bits. Some good learning today and a good bit of experimentation with colour too. Whatever you do with the rest of your day, have a great one. Bye bye. Hello Angel students. Today I want us to talk about the importance of fun and rest. Fun and rest play crucial roles in our lives. No matter how old you are, we all need some fun and some rest. So in this lesson, we are going to distinguish why fun is important and what fun means to you individually. And we're also going to discuss the significance of rest and ways for taking effective rest breaks. And we will also learn how to recognise when we need to take some rest the benefits of making sure we incorporate fun into our lives can help with our mood, can help with creativity and can improve our relationships with our friends and families. The important thing to do here is to be really individual and mindful about what you find to be fun because sometimes we go along with what other people are doing or what might be trendy or what you just might have at hand at any time. So it's really important to really get to know what makes you feel as if you are having fun. Something that you do that you can do for such a long time that you don't even necessarily realize just how much time has passed by. That is real fun. When you are lost in the moment and time doesn't even seem to exist because you're having so much fun, time flies. I want to encourage you to think of some activities that you find really fun and enjoyable. It's really important that these are fun for you. It's not about anybody else. It's not about what anybody else enjoys. It's about what brings you joy and happiness. What makes you feel full of joy, smiles, ease, happiness when you engage in these activities. What are those? Be very clear about what they are so that you can incorporate them into your life. So I have put together a few questions that may help you to narrow down exactly what makes you feel as if you're having fun. Just to get you thinking and narrowing it down to specific things so that you can be clear on what fun means to you. So what activities make you lose track of time? As I said before, when time just flies, what activities is it that you get so lost in that you lose track of time? What hobbies or interests bring you joy? 
If you could do it right now, right this second, what would it be that you would go and do as an activity that you know will bring you immense joy? And how do you feel when you engage in having fun? Because it's those feelings, those feel good feelings, when it's releasing those happy chemicals that make you want to continue to do what you're doing. So what are some of those feelings? Do you feel excited? Do you feel like you're not thinking about anything else that's going on? Do you feel like you are enjoying the time with other people if it's something that you do with a group or one more person? Is it that you feel a sense of curiosity because the fun entails maybe some thinking and you're not quite sure how this could go? It could be a strategic game that you like to play. So you've got to be very aware of what moves you make so that you win the game. Sometimes we may even find ourselves in situations where Something is fun to us, but to our friends or our family, it's not so fun for them. So it can cause you to feel swayed or pressured even to not like it as much. And that is not fair on you. You have absolutely every right to enjoy what you enjoy and have fun with the things that you enjoy. So being clear about the things that make you passionate and excited from the inside is nothing to be ashamed of and everything to embrace. Sometimes with the seriousness of everything that goes on in this world and the things that we have to do and the priorities that we have, we forget that we should be having fun as well. We forget that life is about having fun. It's about experiences. It's about new experiences. It's about adventure and it's about being as adventurous as you possibly can with the opportunities that you have. And being able to explore any adventurous experiences is your right. So figure out what makes you feel happy and excited and as if you are experiencing fun. Your body will thank you for it, your mood will definitely love you for it and the people around you will sense that energy of fun from you and make them want to be around you more. Have you ever noticed the person in the room that just likes to have fun, they're always smiling, they have a happy and sunny way about them, they're always thinking positively, they're always wanting to try new things, they're always up for whatever's going on because they love the adventure of life itself. They know what fun means to them and they know why they want to explore certain things. They love the feeling of having fun because they know that that is a great feeling to embrace, to have and to share with others. And here are some more reasons why fun should be incorporated as much as possible. Fun is extremely good for your emotional health and well-being. Remember I said it improves mood and releases all those good chemicals and the endorphins and everything that make, makes us want to smile. Fun is relaxing. It calms the mind. It keeps you in the present moment of what you're doing because you're enjoying it so much that you're not bothered about what's going on around you. So it promotes relaxation naturally. Fun encourages creativity, imagination and exploration. It gets your imaginative juices flowing, it gets your creativity flowing and it makes you want to explore more. When you're having fun, you want more. Fun strengthens your connections with friends, family and even new people that you don't necessarily know. You may go somewhere to try a new activity or be in an open space. Say you wanted to try something like rock climbing or go-karting, it could be anything that is outside and therefore is going to have people in the public that are doing it that you don't necessarily know. It's a point of socialising where you could meet other people, get to know them and engage with them just as you would those that you do know. And my favourite reason for engaging in as much fun as possible, it breaks up the routine and in doing so it allows us to recharge and rejuvenate 
rejuvenate. Just feeling like having that change in routine and that little interruption to just have some fun, let off some steam, do something different, really can help us to reset. And now let's talk about rest because after we've had all that fun and we've experienced all the excitement and the new adventures and the new experiences, we might end up feeling a little bit tired. So it will be essential to recharge our body and minds. It improves our productivity, creativity, and just like fun, our overall emotional well-being. So just think about times when you've been really tired and you've been able to have a very peaceful night's sleep. And then the next morning when you wake up, you feel re-energized, rejuvenated and ready for the day. So just that alone can show you how important rest is. And on this channel, we have spoken about the importance of sleep before, but that's not exactly what I'm referring to this time. I'm talking about rest, consciously resting, being aware of your body and knowing when you might need to take some rest. So different ways that you might do that could be by taking a break. You could be doing something and you just lose your concentration. It's not quiet at its peak. Sometimes you just need to take a break from whatever it is that you're doing. Give your mind, just give your mind a moment to just stop. And then what you can do is go back and you will be much more focused. Why? Because you get a moment to relax. You stop pressuring yourself to do what you're doing and get it so right. You give yourself a moment to relax and recharge. Some other ways to rest could be to spend time in nature. You might go to the park and just relax. If it's a nice enough day, you may just be able to relax. If there are some beautiful flower gardens, if there is some grass that you would like to just take a walk in, that you can just enjoy looking at just a landscape, something that you don't have to concentrate on too much, but you can appreciate the beauty of. Deep breathing exercises is another one. You can set a timer for a minute, three minutes, five minutes, it's completely up to you. And just focus on your breathing. Take deep breaths in and deep breaths out until you feel like I'm back, rejuvenated and recharged. Another one is listening to music. I would encourage you in moments of relaxation to listen to music that doesn't have any lyrics. So it could be instrumentals, it could be a specific frequency of Hertz, HZ, that will relax you. And something that doesn't distract your mind into another form or topic because it doesn't have any lyrics, but it can just relax you. You can listen to the sounds, the tones, the melody, and that should bring you to a place of just balance and centering yourself again. Sometimes we're not even aware of when exactly we need rest until it's too late. So here are some common things that might pop up that are indicators that you might just need to take a little break and have a bit of rest. The most obvious one, you feel tired you feel fatigued and you don't feel like you have much energy. That is a big indicator. You're experiencing difficulty with being able to concentrate on what you're doing. You're getting irritated. You're getting a little bit moody. That is another sign that you need to take some rest. And when you yourself are putting out work or you're doing something that isn't up to the usual standard, of what you know you're capable of. When you just know, I could do so much better than that, but because of how I'm feeling, it's not coming out the way I want it to. Take some rest. There's nothing wrong with taking rest. It's not stopping, it's not quitting, it's certainly not failing, it's just taking a break. It is important for you, for your emotional health, that you recognize when you need a break, when your body is talking to you, 
listen to what it's trying to tell you. By being able to listen to your body when it speaks to you, you can give yourself exactly what you need when you need it. Rest periods support our immune systems, our physical health overall, and give us longevity. In our restful moments, we have an opportunity to learn about ourselves by being still for a moment. It gives us a moment to reflect and to go within and understand ourselves on a deeper level. So in conclusion, when it comes to fun and rest, as different as they are, they are important for similar reasons. They boost your mood, they energize you, they're good for your immune system, great for your emotional health and well-being, promote wellness within you because it causes you to listen to you. Listen to your body, listen to your wants, listen to your needs, listen to what's right for you, what makes you smile, what brings you fun, joy and happiness and that is what you require for a healthy, happy system. Explore different ways to take that rest so that you find the one that best works for you. So in any given situation, there's no need to panic, there's no need to ever worry. You are very in tune with your body. You know exactly what your body is trying to tell you. You listen to it and you honor yourself by providing just that. So, thank you, angel students. I hope that's been of a great help. Bye-bye. Hi, angel school. And follow me do quick breathing exercise first. Slightly bend your knees, arms straight, fingers straight. Breathing in through your nose. When you're breathing in, it's collecting all the good energy into your body. Then breathing out through your nose. When you're breathing out, release all the tension from your body. And when you practice it by yourself, you can do 5-10 times. Let's do a quick exercise for the joints. One foot wide, heel up. And exercise your wrists and ankles. One, two, three, four, five, change. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Exercise your knee joints, helps your knee circulation. One, two, you can bend your knee as much as you can. Three, four. Five. Good. Relax your hands. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Change. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Keep your elbow up, hands reach out as far as you can. One, two, feel a stretch. Open up your lungs. Two, help your lung function. Three, four, five, six, and then one hand as high as you can, one hand lower. This is good for your stomach and spleen function. One, Two, three, four, five, six. Good. Slightly bend your knees and follow your elbow. Look back. One, two, three, four, five. Things. Keep your arms straight, slightly bend your knees, relax your shoulders. One, two, three, four, five, change. 
Whole body relax. One, two, three, four, five. Shoulders down, head up, neck slowly. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, when you feel this neck muscle stretching, that's good. On your shoulders for a circle. One, two, three. Change. One, two, three. Relax your back. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, let's do two quick stretch first, then today we're going to focus on our routine a little bit more. First Kung Fu stance, three and a half at one. One, two, three and a half. Slightly bend your knees, keep your elbow on your knee, push your knee out, breathe it in, and look forward, breathe it out, turn your body. One, breathe it in, look forward. Breathing out, turn your body. Two. Breathing in. And breathing out. Three. Breathing in. And breathing out. Four. Five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Of course, when you do with your breathing, it could be more slow, yeah, because we have a short time, so we do more quicker. But when you do by yourself, you can stretch much longer. This is the first Kung Fu stance, Marble. Second one, Kung Fu. So, similar technique. Early both leg bend, this time, one leg straight, one leg bend. You can keep your hands on your knee if you want to. When you feel stretch, same breathing technique, one. Breathing in through your nose and breathing out through your nose. Two, three. So you don't just focus on the stretching, you focus on your breathing. Use your breathing to stretch. Four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Change. If you feel your leg hurts a little bit, and it's okay. Breathing through. No pain, no gain. One, two. Use your breathing to stretch. Three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Also, when you practice, you can do both sides like. Marble champs kung fu. So first one we did marble, both leg bend. When you change, back leg straight. Marble. When you change, one leg push the floor. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six, seven, and 
Nine, ten. Yeah. So you can use a little bit of power when you're getting more comfortable. Now we're gonna practice the routine we've been practicing before. So for example, when you start, you can just keep your foot apart if you want to. Breathing in, hands up like we did earlier. And breathing out. So clench your fist and elbow strike. Yeah. Then first kung fu stand, marble and block. Yeah. So from here, marble block and punch. Yeah. So one and two. So we did the marble, change combo. Same. Marble, change combo. Yeah. From here, one, two, kick your right hand, three, elbow, punch. Yeah. Then, right hand block. And stand up, same, kick your right leg again, then elbow, block, and punch. Yeah. Let's practice a few more times. So, foot apart, breathing in, hands up. And breathe out. Clench your face. Elbow strength. First Kung Fu stance. Marble. Both leg bent. One hand block. And punch. Yeah, marble turn to Kung Fu. Then kick your right leg. Two. Then right elbow. And three, block and punch. Then step back. Right hand block. And stand up. Then same, kick your right leg. One, marble, block and punch. Feels good. Okay, let's practice three more times together. Inhale, hands up. And exhale. Clench your face. And elbow strike. Marble, block, combo punch. One, kick your right leg. Elbow and punch then block one two three kick elbow block punch okay two more times inhale hands on and exhale. Clench your feet. One, two, marble, punch. One, two, elbow, two, three, punch. Four, block. Facing wings, kick one, two, block, punch, clench your fingers. Okay, one more time. Inhale and exhale. 
and your fist. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here. So let's practice the last three breathing exercises. Hope your body recovering. Huh? You can start with two foot wide, foot point straight, slightly bend your knees, whole body relax, foot down, head up. Release the tension from your shoulder and neck, and turn your hands to your feel stretch. Breathing in, hands up. Breathing out, and down. Make sure when you breathe in, breathe in from your lower abdomen, not from here. Breathing in, and breathing out. Last one. Breathing in through your nose. And breathing out through your nose. Okay. And let's finish here. Please like and subscribe so you could get more and more lessons.